I have the pleasure of introducing a panel that is central to today's discussion. The next session is called Refugee Resilience, Guiding the Way Forward, and it's going to be moderated by Foundation President and CEO uh, Peter Lawhon. In just a few hours, the Foundation will be presenting the 2022 Hilton Humanitarian Prize to Norwegian Refugee Council, and this session will therefore look at structures that have to be put in place for the successful integration of refugees, whether in place where there are strong integration systems or places that are less welcoming, including the importance of public-private partnerships. And we hope for that discussion to focus not only on challenges and barriers that limit integration, but also on the successes that can be shared as examples to emulate. This session will also look at how the expertise of individuals experiencing forced displacement or having experienced it must be part of developing solutions. I'm going to let Peter introduce our panelists who are all experts in their fields, but please welcome to the stage Peter Lawhorn and John Thorn Thon Majoke, Zarlash Halamzai, and Sana Ala Ali Mustafa. Welcome. Thank you, Salvador. Uh, and I promise everyone this will be a lively, informative, and inspiring conversation uh, on an important topic. Now, uh, as, as Salvador said, we have uh, three very knowledgeable and experienced people on this panel who have all themselves experienced displacement, been refugees, and devoted their life's work to humanitarian and refugee uh, efforts. So they can talk about it from the inside, and, and from the effort to, to build a system and strengthen it. Um, we have with us Jonathan Majok, who is the director of the Refugees and Forced Displacement Initiative at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, and from South Sudan originally. We have Zarlash Halamzai, who is the founder and CEO of AMNA, and from Afghanistan originally. And we have Sana Ali Mustafa, the CEO of Asylum Access. Uh, and as you know, you've heard today, one of the foundation's uh, strategic initiatives is in refugees. And we are committed not only to work with the global system, but also, and very importantly, to work with refugee-led organizations. Today, there are, as you've heard, over 100 million people worldwide who've been displaced from their homes, more than 1% of the global population, and over 30 million of them are refugees. Uh, and you know, we, we have put a lot of emphasis, rightly, on the difficulty on the challenges, on the vulnerability of, of refugees. We've talked about the importance of compassion and solidarity. But I think what the tone of this conversation is, is uh, much more about admiration for strength, for resilience, and for resourcefulness, and how refugees are actors, in, in not only in the future of their, their refugee community, but also of the host countries that they come to and, and often of the, the, the countries they return to. Um, so I'd like to start off really hearing a bit about the stories of each of you. Uh, and could you tell us a bit about, uh, about the displacement and then how it led to the work that you're doing? And so now perhaps we can start with you. Sure, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for having us here and uh, for everyone for being here. Um, so yeah, my name is Sana Ali Mustafa. Um, I'm originally from Syria. I was born and raised there. And I was born to a very political family that you know, lived under a dictatorship and still on, of ongoing dictatorship like many other um, countries in the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, and I always mention how it was very important growing up navigating um, the public sphere versus the private sphere, where in the public sphere, we just had to not exist um, no opinions exist, nothing <laughs> exists, but whereas in the private sp sphere, my parents were very um, eager to make sure that we are aware of what's happening in our environment, and it's not normal that you know, we don't have our freedoms and um, all the, uh, the oppression that was happening. And so that led when the Syrian revolution started in, in March 2011. My family and I were the first to take over the streets as well, protesting alongside so many other Syrians, demanding freedom, justice, um, and state of law in Syria. 
And so the situation in Syria started as a revolution. People led revolution. Um, and we paid the price for that. Um, we, myself and my sister and my father, got detained um, by the Assad regime. We got released and then we continued until 2013 when my father um, was taken by the Assad regime for the third time. Um, and he, he has been forcibly disappeared ever since. So it's been nine years since we've known anything about my father, if he's alive or dead, and that's the situation of 100,000 of Syrians. Um, and as a result, they came after the family, and my mom, my sisters um, smuggled to Turkey. I had just made it to the US for um, what was supposed to be a summer school, and um, I was you know, informed I can't go back home, so I seek political asylum, and I suddenly became a person of forced displacement. Uh, I found myself in a situation where you know, I was deprived of everything. I had lost my home, um, my, my father, you know, knowledge of his presence, um, you know, money, le legal documents, all of it. And I started my journey here trying to, you know, just um, get my rights. And I think that was the first thing I was able to seek my, my asylum in the US, uh, my political asylum, and then, you know, trying to make my way through this. Um, but I always say the one thing that I, or the two things that I absolutely have always had, even when I lost everything, were the values that my parents planted in me um, and the Syrian revolution mm -hmm. uh, also planted in me and then also my, my voice, uh, which no one can take away. And those are the tools that really still guide my way forward. And then animate your work in asylum Thank action. You. Powerful. Thank you. Zarlash, your story. Um, there's so much um, that I can relate to from what you said. Um, so my family, a very ordinary family, um, was you know from Kabul, and um, we had very ordinary aspirations, you know, to go to school, um, to get jobs, to get married. Um, but we were living in a pretty extraordinary time um, in the 80s, where you know two superpowers were clashing in Afghanistan, uh, which led to a lot of violence. Um, and so my parents really made a very difficult decision to leave our home uh, and what we thought would be a temporary thing. Um, we went to the neighboring country, um, and the idea was what, that we would wait out the violence and go back home, which is very typical of refugee experience. Uh, a lot of refugees move to neighboring countries in the hope that they can go back home at some point. Uh, but like many, many refugees around the world, um, it became very clear that we can go back home. So after four years, as the Taliban took over the country, um, my parents realized that going back home was completely untenable. My mom was a teacher. She had spent her entire life teaching and educating girls. So the idea of going back to a Taliban-ruled country was just not something she could deal with. Um, so we sought asylum in the UK, and um, after four years of waiting around, um, and that's, you know, that's when we started kind of our new life, and, you know, a sort of prevailing myth um, and, and displacement stories that once you arrive in your final destination, that when you're, you're safe and things begin to you know, sort themselves out. Uh, but really, it's the beginning of a whole new set of challenges. And it was, you know, suddenly we had to deal with integrating into a new culture, learning a new language, dealing with a bureaucracy that we'd never dealt with, um, you know, kind of going through the asylum process, which is incredibly traumatic. You're asked to recount your story mm -hmm. over and over again. Um, and that led to a whole host of other problems for my family. And I remember as a, as a teenager, I really found it difficult um, and, you know, really was feeling quite a lot of anger and just found it very difficult to be um, in school. And so I was referred to, um, you know, a psychologist and a therapist. And what became very, very quickly apparent is that they had no idea what to do with someone like me. Um, and I spent most of my time educating them mm -hmm. about my background and where I was from and my identity. And, and this experience really stayed with me. And then as, as a humanitarian, I was working on the Turkish-Syrian border for about 18 months uh, in 2014, 2015, which was an incredibly 
horrible time and during the mm -hmm. Syrian war and people were going through horrific violence and there was no, literally no provision for trauma care. And so it became very clear to me that, you know, seeing my own experiences reflected in, in Syrian child, I wanted to do something about it. So I founded the organization that I run, which is called Amna, and it's all about commu providing communities with safe spaces where they can um, process and heal um, as groups, as communities, and, 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 and contend with what's happened to them. Thank you so much. Please. Hey, Jonathan, how about you? I was born in a village in South Sudan, and I was a cowboy. Uh, <laughs> then the Civil War hit between the North and South Sudan, so I walked to Ethiopia, three and a half years in Ethiopian refugee camps. There was a political upheaval again in Ethiopia, walking back to the border of Sudan, walk along the border to Kenya. And so I live in Kenya for almost 10 years in the refugee camp in Northwest Kenya. A total of 13 years in the refugee camps and displaced camp. And as you heard earlier today uh, from our inspiring poet, no one can send a child to the river unless you believe it is safer in the river than in the land. And that was the situation where we were very young and walked because it was believed that it would be safer to walk than to sit still in the villages we were born. And forced displacement is an assault on human dignity. And it disrupted that life at the early age. But I came to cope with the adversity of, um, of refugee life in four different ways, which I call uh, the four resilient factors. One is my upbringing, uh, the way I was brought up, and, and the words of, uh, of my dad. Uh, it became a, a frame of reference mm -hmm. when I f faced those adversities. Second, was the community network. So we were displaced in group. We were together 15, 16 to 20,000 unaccompanied children. And so we became our own family in exile in those refugee camps. So community network was important and it was a coping mechanism. And third is, is, is my religious faith. Gave me hope, it paved the way for you know, a better life to get meaning out of my suffering. <clears throat> and finally, a drive for formal education. My first uh, formal uh, education was under the tree in Ethiopia refugee camp, where my first exam was writing in the sand uh, on the floor. Uh, there were no notebooks. Um, so it became, it's, it became something that I could cling to because there were no cows anymore in, in the refugee camps. So these four resilient factors kept me going, and I think they fit within the theme of the power of perseverance today. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> I, I think we could not have asked for uh, three stronger portraits of, of resilience and of taking a, a difficult situation and making it purposeful uh, and, and aiming it at making the system better. Jonathan, uh, several years ago you wrote an article that actually inspired the title of this session on refugee resilience. And, and you, you noted that although displacement and refugee status are an immense tragedy, they also show the great strength of, of the refugees, the dignity, the agency, uh, and resilience. So you've talked about what helped you move forward. Now as you talk to policymakers, as you talk to UN officials, the US government, as you talk to funders, how do you express that in, in policies and in systems? My dad tested my human agency when I was very young. Hmm. And this is what he told me. He told me to figure out, the word figure out, uh, figure out thing by myself so that I get to know better. He knew that I had a human agency even at that early age. 
So when refugees are given the opportunity to test their human agency, to utilize, um, you can see the result. And that's why human agency, uh, in terms of their capacity, their resilience need to be recognized in any policy discourse. Because what live experience does it, is, it, is that it broadens the perspective on certain issues. I was born in a village. I didn't know what's going on around the world. But I became, as I became a refugee, I knew different contexts and what is going on around me. And that experience, the live experience, cannot be, you know, it's not, it's not a research thing. Uh, it's, there's no substitute for it. And so I have, as I work on policy issues, and especially on protracted uh, refugee situation, because I have lived there for uh, more than a decade, I am thinking back of the people mm -hmm. that, were in the that are still in the same camp that I was in more than uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, it, it, imp it, it, it informs what I do, that it is part of me. There is another aspect of, um, uh, of live experience is that the relatability. When you give refugees the opportunity to tell their narrative, others can relate to their stories and as they relate, they can inform their political leaders to act. Experience showed that, you know, when you relate to something, mm -hmm. you can effectively uh, address it. In literature, in social theory literature, of course, is that most of the successful social interventions are done by the people that are affected the most. Mm -hmm. So when you give people the opportunity to tell their story. Um, they want to change things through their story, and that's how policymakers can pick it up. So that's the perspective I bring uh, working on these refugee issues. Is just It has broadened my ex uh, perspective, but i also hoping that it can inform policymakers to read that refugees are not the problem to be addressed. They are the symptoms of the problem. And so when they tell their stories, they, they should not be seen as others. They are our fellow human beings. They are our sisters, brothers, neighbors, mothers. And so that's the, the perspective that, that I think can uh, inform policymaking. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, Sana, let's talk a bit about global commitments toward refugees and displaced people. As you know, in 2016, the World Humanitarian Summit in, uh, in Istanbul made a commitment about funding flows, 25% to local organizations, and about refugee-led and community-led efforts that would be supported. Where are we on that, and uh, why are we where we're at? Thank you. Is that work? It's working? It's yeah. Working. yeah. Apparently, I needed two mics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I don't know how much people in the room are familiar even with like localization. I feel it's a very specific sector terminology, but, but basically it's really, um, maybe the bigger context would be what John was talking about, that this situation, forced displacement, and so many other poverty, so forced displacement, um, so many of the issues that are happening in the global major majority are addressed, and the solutions are designed, and the decisions are made by people who are very far away from these mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. People who live and sit in the global north, people who make decisions on solutions for people in the camps in, uh, in Kenya. Um, and so the issue, this is the main issue in general in the humanitarian and development sector, that historically um, these solutions, that can, starting with the UN Convention, you know, were designed by people who are far from the lived experience and who are <laughs> also geographically far from the context of where these um, crises are taking place. And so I think it's important to recognize the roots of our system, the colonial roots that still manifest until today. And so what has been happening in the last 10 years, um, there has been finally conversations about, oh, like maybe we should 
channel more resources to those who are on the ground to be part of leading solutions and programs. And this is when the conversation about localization started. But I mean, imagine that you actually have to localize solutions that have been targeted at the local people after 70 years because they were not localized to start with. Um, the issue right now is that with the definition of localization in, in the sector, it's, it's more about, it's thinking about how could local actors, and we understand local actors as including national govern uh, governments, um, local civil society, host community civil society organizations, and how can they be part of um, receiving more money, how they can be part of designing the solutions with the global actors, how they can integrate, that's the word Ekba uses, how they can integrate into being part of the solutions and the mechanisms that the global organizations are designing. The problem was that we are not in this way really addressing that, well, what about the structure itself? Maybe re-examining the structure instead of re-examining how people could be part of the same structure that's not designed by the people to start with. And so my issue, my first issue, issue with localization, it does not address root cause power imbalance. I would call for power shifting. Uh, which is completely, it will, it will mean we have to examine, dismantle existing structures and system and rebuild them what, and let the people at, be at the heart and the center of leading, rebuilding those with those who have not experienced forced displacement instead of those who have not experienced forced displacement inviting me occasionally, you know, to be, uh, to be part of a system they designed. And so, <laughs> thank you. And so back to those, you know, within lo so this is localization within this commitment to from lo uh, to towards localization from global actors. There have been numbers of occasions where they announced pledges and commitment towards let's do better in channeling more money. Again, in the first one, not shifting power, um, and in that one, there's the commitments from like like global bargain and the World mm -hmm. Humanitarian Summit to give local organization more money. That commitment started with 2.8 in 2016, and as of 2.8% uh, of the money going to local actors in 2016. By 2020, it was 3.1. That's how much it increased. <laughs> so um, another example would be, you know, out of the $30 billion money circulating within the humanitarian system, we estimate less than 1% goes to refugee-led organizations, mm -hmm. which are subcategory of local actors. So we have national governments, host community organizations, local actors, and there's sub-marginalized category called refugee-led organizations. Like those are the initiatives led by, by the persons who've experienced forced displacement, and they have more barriers to exist. They can't register, they can't have bank accounts, all of that. So those people, like, let's, if we're talking about the women's rights movement, so imagine women-led organizations would get less than 1% out of the money that's going to address women mm -hmm. rights. So that's how yep. bad we're doing. Yep. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's not going well at all. <laughs> so I, I, I sense a call to action coming. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. So right. there is a call to action and that to say, I mean, I'm not pessimistic at all, but I also like to acknowledge what's happening and then we can talk about ways forward. There are successful examples and there has been more conversations mm -hmm. about shifting power towards refugee-led organizations and those with lived experience. Mm -hmm. And there are now current examples and I wouldn't say from global institutions. Mm -hmm. I would not give them that credit to be honest. They have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But I would give the credits to a number of other uh, foundations. I mean, Hilton is one of them. Mm -hmm. We have OSF, we have Porticus. We have a number of foundations who are getting it and, and really channeling resources in significant fashion to refugee-led organizations to be able to address their own solutions. Thank you so much, Sana. Zalash, uh, what would you like the public to know about the, the situation of refugees, uh, both in terms of uh, the, the scale and the impact of forced displacement, but also the, the power of refugees? Um, I'm, first of all, I'm so inspired by yeah. what you both have said. Um, it, th there's, you know, isn't a, a neat, answer to that, Peter. Mm -hmm. But I think, so there's two things when I think about the refugee crisis. The first one is what's already been mentioned in the panel, which is refugees are not the problem, they're a symptom 
of, uh, of structures in the world and structures of violence um, that often have colonial roots and the, a lot of the places that produce refugees have been um, subject to violence for a very long time. So for example, my home country in uh, Afghanistan has been, you know, we've Afghanistan has been at war for 42 years, and many, many countries around the world have been involved in that war. So the first thing to understand is that people that are, the things that produce large dis, you know, numbers of displaced people are global structures, um, and, and structures in which we're all complicit in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so gaining that understanding and, and, and the root cause of why people are fleeing their homes, which is usually conflict, inequality, poverty, all those things are, um, yeah, global structures of power. Um, and it's really difficult to kind of get into that and contend with a, the number, 100 million. So the second thing that I would say is an entry point for understanding is to really go down to what happens to an individual, to a human being um, when, they are, when they're displaced. And that's where we can really have, you know, there's a lot of universal things that happen to refugees that we all experience. So imagine experiencing loss, you know, of, you know, we all lose family members, people that we love. This is something that happens to refugees all the time. So when they're leaving their home, it's usually because something really terrible has happened and it pushes people out. You know, the kind of grief that you experience when you lose, first of all, your language, you know, your capacity to communicate, your points of reference, um, the things that give you joy and, you know, all of the, you know, I think these are all very universal human experiences which refugees experience in the extreme. Um, but what I've experienced in my own community, you know, um, I, as I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will know, I, I, Afghanistan went back to the Taliban the last year. And many, many women in my country who had spent 20 years fighting for their rights lost everything overnight. Um, but despite repeated assaults on, um, on the community that I come from, there is mobilization of women and young people, um, you know, going back and trying to do something and fighting um, in the communities that I work in now. There is so much hope, resilience, and joy. The organization that I run, we put joy at the center of what mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because, you know, that is the, the that's the, the, the kind of the ultimate outcome that we want for the community. It's intrinsic. We want to create conditions where people can feel that. And I experience that resilience, that joy, that post-traumatic growth every day in my practice. Um, and so going back to what my panelists mm -hmm. have said, the communities that are experiencing this have the intelligence, the insight, the creativity, and the lived experience, the knowledge, the expertise that you need to really address what's happening. We just need to remove the barriers. Mm -hmm. We need to get out of the way um, for them to be able to really, you know, push for the solutions that we know work. Thank you so much. And all of you, have experienced a number of countries, of, of host countries and transition countries since you left your own. Uh, tell us your thoughts about how those societies, and, and I think you, you specifically all know the US quite well, uh, could work better to receive refugees, and what people in the room and online could do and think about in order to support that. And whoever would like to take the question. Yeah, let's go first. Um, displaced people and refugees face three structural forces that <coughs> limit the opportunities and capacities. One are the displacing factors, obviously the push factors, what led them to live in the first place. If the displacing factors are still in the country of origin, those forces prevent them from returning. So they stay wherever they are in the host country. The second set of forces 
are the marginalizing forces that hinder their integration into her society. And those forces, those barriers include the lack of legal recognition in the host country, um, you know, the lack of political will to even uh, address the issues. So they are kept in the refugee camp, and encampment policy is a barrier to their integration. Example is Kenya, uh, kept people out of the, the mainstream and put them in the refugee camp. So the marginalizing forces don't allow refugee to integrate. And then the third factors are the immobilizing forces that block their upward mobility. And so they will sit there, not going anywhere. They don't have freedom of movement, uh, no choice to expand their uh, human agency. Those immobilizing forces prevent them from even reaching the third uh, country for the settlement. And so we have to address these three structural forces to be able to allow the human agency of the refugees to be put in, 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 in use. Now the United States is a global leader in refugee resettlement, no question about that. Um, but I think, yeah, given the scale of the problem in the 21st century, uh, U.S. need to step up its leadership because then it's where others will follow. Uh, for example, we have the situation in Ukraine now, situation in Afghanistan, the Venezuela crisis, the Syrian crisis are some of the major uh, emergencies as we speak. But then there have been emergency situations that have existed for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. Those are, they, they are now at the back end of the attention. Um, I read an article in the New York Times yesterday that told a story of a Somali refugee mm -hmm. who had been trying to bring his two sons to join him here for seven years. And then it was told recently that, okay, this situation will resolve in the summer. Now the, Un the United States is not looking at those again, the backlog. The United States is addressing the situation of Ukraine, the Venezuela uh, situation, and, and those are now at the back. Now, resettlement from experience is always a hope when mm -hmm. you heard that you are going for a settlement. That is when you think, you know, you have a better future. But if this hope comes to an end, at some point you can imagine the situation the refugees are. And that goes back to the system itself. Do we have a resilient system that addresses the magnitude of crisis we are facing? This is where public-private uh, pri uh, partnership comes in. If the government cannot handle it, can the private sector come in? Can the private citizen come in? We talk about uh, private sponsorship of refugees. Mm -hmm. The Canadian system used that. And uh, the United States, I think, is piloting this. This is where the citizen can get involved to see what they can do if the government is not doing anything. But it all needs ha all hands on deck. And these structural forces are beyond the capacity of the, uh, the, the displaced people to address al alone. And mm -hmm. they are beyond the capacity of the host country. This is why we need collective effort and partnership. So between the private sector, the philanthropic, civil society. Exactly. And refugee-led. And yeah. Sana, I see you have a thought. Yeah, yeah I mean, I fully <coughs> agree. Um, I mean, it has been proven. I mean, it, it, it's obvious, right? Like when we talk in the morning, we, we're talking about intersectionality, right? And now we understand in intellectual terms that the need to solutions to be addressed from all different dimensions. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as, as it was mentioned, this is not um, a new thing, right? Like all feminist theorists from Audre Lorde to, to the day have addressed the importance of, you know, you cannot look at immigration and refugee situation in the US without thinking about racism, without thinking about socioeconomic classism, mm -hmm. th without thinking about all of those things. So addressing these situations doesn't mean only 
putting a lens into it, actually mm -hmm. movements working together. And mm -hmm. I think this is the main issue is that in the forced displacement sector, in the refugee sector, we've been, we do things alone, we've been isolated. And now in the refugee leadership movement, we are learning that the barriers we're facing about centering the lived experience mm -hmm. have been faced by the feminist movement, by the black movement, by the indigenous rights movement. They have been navigating the same barriers of m wanting agency over their own lives. And we have a lot to learn from and we have a lot to, to do together. But I wanna go back also to your question about what could host community mm -hmm. and what could host governments and people do better. It matters who, I mean, so many people like refugees, it's a, um, you know, international situation. It's, like, uh, it's, um, it's not a domestic one, right? It's a very domestic one. And exercise your citizenship. <laughs> who you put in office does matter when, when I mean, I'm, not sure about political views here, I'm gonna say my own experience. When the, travel, the Muslim travel ban happened in March 2017 by the Trump administration, my very own mother and sister got declined family unification to come see me here after three years of being in process. So these policies do have impact on our lives, had impact on me as now a US citizen, being now an American, I cannot bring my family, had impact on my ability to feel stable here, to be able to integrate, to be able to contribute. And so exercising our citizenship here is important. Uh, and that doesn't only mean like, you know, elections, it also means giving attention, being, and if you, that doesn't matter, then at least exercise something about current issues, right? Because they do affect me. Like I exist here with all my multi-layered identities, you know? I'm a woman, I'm a queer woman, I'm brown, and I'm a refugee, and I'm a Muslim, and, and even if I am not a refugee, those identities are enough bring me lots of struggle with the current system here in, the, in this country, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's important that really one fight, when we fight for one movement, by default we are fighting for other, for other movements, and that's important to keep in mind. The last thing I wanna say, when there's the will, things change, and we've seen that in Ukraine. It's a perfect, beautiful example. Exactly, this is how it should work. And we're not saying that we're, we don't like, we're un unhappy that Ukrainian refugees have been offered safety with dignity. But we're saying is that all refugees, regardless of their race and their ethnicity and background and gender, should have uh, be offered safety with dignity and not have to wait in camps for 20 years to potentially, only like 3% of refugees in the world get resettled. And, not, and going through really undignifying processes. So that's an example that we should hold now governments accountable towards it. And you set the bar high by Ukraine, and let's make sure we don't accept that the bar goes low again. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we, we, we promised the audience some solutions as well. And I think we've given a lot of raw material and, and a lot of effort and potential. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit to the country of Colombia and, and what they have done. Uh, the audience may or may not be aware that uh, Colombia basically declared uh, Venezuelan refugees to have the same rights as Colombians, all the same rights except to vote, uh, and they gave them an amnesty for 10 years, uh, which speaks to what Jonathan had said about, about mainstreaming, about mobility, et cetera. Uh, and, and the percentage of their population that was involved is roughly equivalent to the percentage of undocumented people in the United States today. So I was wondering, Jonathan, if you could tell us a little bit about, about that experience, how it's gone, what, what can be um, presented to other countries? So it is a very, very good example of best practice in refugee integration, the situation of uh, the, what the Colombian government has done and to another extent, the Ecuadorian government integrating the Venezuelan refugees into their society. But I think it, it, it has to start from the top. It's, it, you know, the tone has to be set. And so the president of Colombia set a tone that these are our brothers and sisters. Let's treat them with dignity. They are our fellow neighbors. I think that's, that comes into the psyche of the average citizen that yes, let's look them as brothers and sisters. So when you set that tone, um, it can impact life in positive ways. And what the Colombian government has done is that it removed that psychological um, cloud in the mind of a displaced person that, oh, I am not recognized, I am not welcome in this society. And when you, 
no example with our kids. When you talk, I have, you no, know, have kids, and when you talk to them, they, they, they only know you and what you tell them, and if you tell them wrong information, that can depress their life. It's, that's the same thing with the displaced people. If you think you are not welcome here, it, it will stick there, because they wake, wake up every day that they are not welcome. But when you remove that cloud and, you know, have the welcome message, that's why we have, you know, any welcome message when somebody comes to our door. Because we feel good about that. So that's what the Colombian mm -hmm. government has done. Not other countries, I mean, not all countries have that. Example is the Kenyan government. And this is the, the country that host me for almost 10 years. They are very hospitable, we're grateful mm -hmm. for the, but the idea of keeping those fellow human outside, you know, the, the society in, a, in those camps does not help because those camps that were established in the 1990s are still there. How many generations of children have been born there? Why are we wasting their human potential? Can we take an example of the Colombian government to, to do that? Uh, so that it all goes back to leadership, mm -hmm. to, to set the tone, and then citizen. I, I want to quickly point out that we don't want to allow the countries of origin to be free riders in this. I think mm -hmm. we want to hold them accountable. So when the U.S. leadership talk about the root causes, those countries should not receive foreign aid if they are not addressing mm -hmm. the root causes, why people are leaving those countries. And the same thing with the host countries, they should be supported for, you know, responsibility sharing, but also resource sharing. Again, this is why public-private partnership mm -hmm. is important, mm -hmm. because you help the host countries, but you also establish refugee initiative in the host countries to help them with their livelihood, self-reliant initiatives, while they are waiting for the return or integration. Mm -hmm. We have to let them have something uh, to improve their lives there. Fantastic. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you each for a wrap-up um, call to action in five minutes or so, but in the meantime, let's tackle the global system. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I know you're doing this every day, but I, I, I'm struck by the similarity of spirit between the conversation between Zainab and Shamaran uh, and how BRAC started and what it grew into and your spirit in this moment about a 21st century humanitarian system worthy of the name, form fit for the challenges that are in front of us. So just, I would love your, your guidance to the audience about what we should be doing now to help the system do what it needs to do. Well, I, I, can, I can have a go at yeah. sorting out the global system. Um, <laughs> I think the first thing is to have an honest conversation about the humanitarian system as a whole. Um, and so I'm really encouraged that we're having that conversation here. Um, it's a microcosm of the world, right? So all the kind of structures and dynamics of um, inequality, racism, power, you know, and unequal power dynamics exist within the humanitarian system. And I think being able to, without blaming anyone, having a conversation about how those af affect the people that the humanitarian system is meant to serve is the starting point for looking for solutions. Um, I, th you know, as a, as a recipient, as a refugee who got, um, we got food packages when we were in Afghanistan. And there were some very strange things in our food package. <laughs> when we were, just things that we were like, we don't really need this right now, you know? And then as a humanitarian, um, also just kind of working with communities where you basically view them as passive recipients of aid. Um, and that creates all kinds of problems. First of all, you're not delivering services that are fit for purpose. Second of all, you're replicating the very same power dynamics that drive people from their home in the first place. Um, and so kind of reckoning with that, I think, is a really important thing. And it's not the people that work within the humanitarian system. I think the vast majority of people that have been my colleagues are committed 
to the service that they are providing, it's the structure. Mm -hmm. So going in, pumping lots of money for a short period of time, not building local community resilience. And Afghanistan is a really good case study. 20, for 21 years, humanitarian organizations were incredibly active in Afghanistan. And now that a lot of that's gone, there's very little to show for it. And I think it's kind of like, who's held, you know, how do we hold, is there any kind of accountability for that? How do we measure whether the aid that we're providing is actually doing what it says it does? So I think having an honest conversation and then talking about accountability and where that comes from could be a starting point. Fantastic. Sana? Of course I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so why not? I think I've been addressing the global system from mm -hmm. the beginning. Um, but I want to very much agree uh, with what has been said because, um, you know, you mentioned like, yeah, let's talk about the solutions. It is we have to take time to acknowledge the problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to take time to acknowledge the history of the sector and its continuous manifestation. And, and we have to have these honest, brave, courageous conversations to be able to move, for, to move forward with reconciliation. Because the issue is that symbolic partnerships, tokenistic partnerships with local actors mm -hmm. are, are not going to work anymore. It doesn't work. We ha a lot of the refugee-led organizations have really major trust issues with global institutions. They have disappointed us for so long. I mean, imagine. 70 years since the convention of the UNHCR, billions of dollars, and we still have camps without basic to access, access to basic human rights. Why would I trust? And I even, I, I always invite donors to think, why do we still give to the same people if there is no impact? Why do we still give to the same people who deliver solutions without dignity? Why do we still invest in the same exact actors who have become an industrial complex? So my invitation mm -hmm. here is to, to think to do things differently. I invite donors and those who hold power in any way or capacity to first look internally, mm -hmm. have conversations, have acknowledgement, and then create processes towards reconciliation internally in your organizations, institutions, and this organically would reflect on how you do things to the outside. You don't need to bring a uh, gender lens when your teams are representatives organically. It just happens. It's, ma it's manufactured mm -hmm. into your products mm -hmm. on the outcome product. The second thing I would invite everyone, and especially, again, those who hold power, a part of the system to do, is when you, after you've done your internal work, really think about, before you en engage with anyone, about three questions. The what, the how, and the who. And all we do in the sector, we think about the what. How many times do we hear, this organization does an amazing job. They have reached a million people. How? How did they reach this million people with dignity? How many people were traumatized on the way? What was the dynamic? Did that actually address something? And who are they? I mean, are they like this? Are they repeating, perpetuating power dynamics that have been existing in the sector? If we do not look into equitable ways of working, then we are still, we are continuing to provide band-aids, not solutions, and we are still not addressing inequity in the forced displacement sector. So looking into when you invest or partner with any organization, thinking about who's leading and how they are centering people with lived experience as part of their leadership and solutions and how their ways of working internally and externally in partnerships and funding are actually led by equity as a value and then how their what is addressing you know, their community. And I here would invite donors to take a step back from the what. Mm -hmm. It's not your business what, the, what they think the solution is. They know what's best for the community. So the solution is not in the what. The, the what changes from a place to another. The solution is in making sure that the who has the, the resources to be able to execute on their how, to be able to deliver to their communities what they need and how they need it. Thank you, Sana. <laughs> Jonathan, it, it looks like we have come into our, our calls to action here. So why, why don't you give us yours? And, no, and I do agree that dialogue is a way forward, and that's what we do best at the Wilson Center. And with the <laughs> Refugee and Forced Displacement Initiative, this is our mission, to expand the space for constructive dialogue using the lived experience of the refugee to bring the new perspective to the discourse. And so, and one other thing is to emphasize again is that public-private partnership. 
involve the private sector to bring with innovative uh, ideas on how to uh, uh, reform the, the global humanitarian system that has served us well for over 75 years, but it needs to be reformed. And the good news is the refugee people have agency. They are people with human dignity. If they are given the opportunity to figure out, they will help us to find a solution. Fantastic, Jonathan. Thank you. I, I think no more needs to be said, really, about the power, the insight, the resilience, the resourcefulness, uh, and the partnership possibilities with refugee-led organizations and with uh, people at community levels. Uh, I would speak, though, to those in the room and those online. You all have influential positions in this world. Please take this to heart. Think about voice. Think about agency. Think about uh, a, a, a set of partnerships that will be more effective. Uh, we are in a century of dislocation. Let's let's make our efforts really address that and resolve that. Uh, and you're all at the head of organizations. Tone starts from the top. It's a brilliant invitation for all of us. So please join me in thanking Sarlasht and Sana and Jonathan today.